As Europe waits on France to form a government, as the world waits on the U.S. to pick a president, who drives the agenda? In the wake of the January 6, 2021 storming of the U.S. Capitol, the rest of the world thought there's no way Americans would ever again elect Donald Trump. So why, despite the court cases and all the initial excitement around Kamala Harris, is he still even or sometimes even ahead in the polls going into Tuesday night's debate against the vice president? The Democrats have scored points on issues like women's rights, all the while shifting towards Trump's views on trade, immigration, how much of a shift? To what degree are self-styled illiberals driving and policy in 2024? Here in France, where the president's tapped a Gaullist conservative to try and form a government that's palatable to a divided parliament, Trump admirer Marine Le Pen insists she in no way had a hand in Emmanuel Macron's pick of Michel Barnier, even though the far-right leader has clearly emerged as kingmaker from an inconclusive snap election. Are the illiberals winning the battle of ideas. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking just how much does populism drive policy? Joining us from Washington, Dalibor Roak, senior fellow at uh, the American Enterprise Institute think tank. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Also in the U.S. Capitol, political strategist Christian Hanley. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Elisa Schell is political scientist who teaches at uh, Nanterre University here in Paris. How are you? Good to be back. And uh, good to see uh, Gérald Olivier, author in French of uh, Cover Up uh, the Biden Clan, America and the Deep State. How are you? Fine. Good evening. You can listen. That's right. Listen, like and subscribe to the France 24 debate on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and other fine streaming services. Uh, before we talk about the U.S. and France, let's begin with the latest. It's out of Germany where the social Democrat-led government is coming off a drubbing at the hands of the far right in two regional elections, and the interior minister this Monday announcing six months of uh, temporary border controls that had existed at its southern and eastern borders extended. Uh, for all the other land borders, this uh, says the interior minister to tackle irregular migration and, quote, Islamist extremism. Uh, Dalibor Roach, this is coming from, again, uh, a, a, an interior minister and a government that is led by the Social Democrats in Germany. What does that tell you? I think it's, first of all, useful to think about um, this challenge in uh, comparative terms, because very often we use the term populist to label very different, very disparate political groups and movements across across Europe and, and indeed in the broader uh, Atlantic space. Um, populism, I think, has to some extent outlived its usefulness. You have uh, political parties that are very staunchly Atlanticist and political parties that are leaning towards Russia and China. You have political parties that are pro-Ukrainian, political parties that would like to you know, end the war by by having Ukraine surrender. You have political parties that present a direct challenge to constitutional orders of their countries or have entrenched themselves in power. The political parties that are far less benign, all of them lumped together under, under the populist label. Uh, I think what has been happening throughout the West is something that is significant and common to all these countries, namely that you have an underserved portion of the electorate that might be suspicious of large-scale migration, that might be more conservative on social and cultural issues, that might be perhaps less tolerant towards sexual and other minorities than we thought. And, and this, this fraction of the electorate is now being served by this wide spectrum of political parties that we you know, lump under the label of populist. To me, the real question is how we can make uh, populism safe for democracy, in a way, to make sure that it does not represent a challenge to constitutional order the way it does in places like Hungary or indeed the United States, and also to make sure that it does not represent a mortal threat to the health of our alliances. And, uh, open and borders, though, central to uh, the whole principle of the uh, European Union at this point. Uh, these are open borders within, I'm, I'm talking about, the EU. Uh, Germany, uh, it's got no, no fewer than nine of those land borders. Um, and again, this is coming from uh, a center-left-led uh, government. So I asked the question, Dalibor, uh, does that mean that there's this shift towards uh, the uh, uh, anti-immigrant ideas of the far right? I mean, you've seen this shift in, in a number of other 
uh, European countries, not least in Denmark, where you had the social democratic government responding to the refugee crisis in pretty, pretty sort of stern and and and, and hawkish, in hawkish terms. And and I think the policy mix that we are going to get as a result of this, if you will, populist upsurge across Europe and beyond, is a much stricter immigration policy, perhaps a tightening of asylum law that would not be to the liking of humanitarian lawyers and international organizations. Um, but the question is whether this is a price worth paying for the preservation of, say, the European project and of, and of Western alliances. And my inclination is to think that, yes, we probably have to live in a world of you know, immigration restrictions, protectionism, uh, and perhaps less tolerant sort of so, so social attitudes than, than we might want to wish for. But that might not be in itself the end of democracy or, or the end of, of the liberal constitutional order. Not necessarily the end of the liberal constitutional order. Uh, we're going to pick up on that point. The whole world is watching what's going on in the U.S., where the, the argument of those who dislike uh, Donald Trump is that democracy is on the ballot. Uh, you've had quite a summer in the U.S., an incumbent shock withdrawal, an assassination attempt, two conventions. Next, the uh, upcoming chapter uh, is Tuesday's debate in Pittsburgh. Matthew Mary Carouchet has that story. On one side, there's Donald Trump with his standard pomp and grandstanding before crowds of fans. On the other, there's Kamala Harris and her face-to-face -face interactions with emotional supporters. They have two diametrically opposed strategies, but both candidates are preoccupied with the same thing. Tuesday's debate. The debate with Joe, how did that work out? And we're going to find it out again on Tuesday night. Is anybody going to be watching? Finally got out of the debate prep to look at these spices. Best part of debate prep so far. Harris has had years of experience with televised debate since she was elected district attorney of San Francisco in 2002. She was able to put Vice President Mike Pence back in his place in 2020. If Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have to I'm speaking. Nonetheless, Trump is a strong adversary. Harris has hired Philippe Reines to play the role of the billionaire for debate simulations. He worked with Hillary Clinton in 2016, which allowed her to dominate the debates, but not to win the election. Trump has also recruited a stand-in for his opponent. Tulsi Gabbard, former Trump rival, has rallied to his cause. She is known for having presented a challenge for Harris in a primary debate five years ago. She put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. Trump has to master his nerves and retain composure. Harris has to seem reassuring and presidential. Those impressions are still pretty shallow. So in many ways, this is as much a job interview for her with this big, broad audience that she's going to have as it is a debate and encounter with the former president. The debate will take place in Philadelphia, cradle of American democracy. The candidates have just over one more day to be ready. Christian Hanley, uh, is it going to be uh, about image, how they look during that debate, or is it going to be about substance and how they respond to key issues? Well, I think for better or for worse, it's going to be more about image than about substance. Um, like the report just said, though, Donald Trump really is going to have to maintain his, his calm and be able to focus on what's the task at hand. Uh, right now, we've seen so far as a candidate who seems to be pretty uh, scared, I would say, of facing Kamala Harris on stage. He was very uh, able to to uh, defeat uh, Joe Biden in the last debate, and he felt very confident after that. But we've seen ever since the ticket switched up uh, that he's become increasingly nervous and jittery and even has kind of stepped away from the campaign trail in large part, uh, doing pressers and, and different events that are in very safe places for him, not in swing states where he needs to be seen. And it's true for Kamala Kamala Harris, the big challenge will be really reintroducing herself to the country. She's been vice president for years now. But in our system, that's a very um, amorphous sort of role to play and very often is not forward facing. And so there are a lot of voters, uh, especially in the swing states who are not very engaged and involved and don't regularly follow American politics, who are going to be meeting uh, Kamala Harris for the first time uh, tomorrow evening. Yeah, there's a lot of criticism saying that uh She's been dodging uh, questions from reporters and questions from, from ordinary citizens that there hasn't been, you haven't had a chance much to hear on these substance issues that uh, we're talking about. 
I, and, and, you know, I, I hear that criticism, but also I've been around long enough to know that it, when Democrats do focus on policy, the American press then faults Democrats for that, saying that they're being too wonkish and talking too much to an inside the beltway policy audience rather than to the American people. What we're seeing right now in the campaign trail is that Kamala Harris really is talking to people, to ordinary people and connecting with them on a visceral level. And honestly, I think a lot of these these policy issues are going to be, for better or worse, like I said before, sort of secondary to uh, the, the vibes, if you will, of this campaign. Right now, we have this really stark dichotomy. On the one hand, you have Donald Trump, who is talking about you know, crisis at the border in America in disarray. And look, the United States has issues like any country does, but it's a very dark image he's portraying of the United States. Meanwhile, we saw at the DNC a jubilant crowd, and even Adam Kinzinger, a former Republican congressman, was, was saying mm. how Democrats really are picking up that torch from the age of Reagan of being the optimist and being the forward-thinking party. And she needs to really underline that contrast there, because people are frankly fatigued of this, this sort of doom and gloom that's coming from the Trump campaign. Yeah, uh, Kamala Harris, though, her uh, post-convention surge has now stalled, according to a New York Times' a Siena College poll. The poll finds voters trust the vice president more on things like preserving democracy, reproductive rights, less, as you can see in this graph, on the economy and on immigration. And that kind of brings us back to uh, what we were saying at the outset, Gérald Olivier, on this side of the Atlantic, on the one hand, we're puzzled. Wait, there was this attempted coup, basically, on, in 2021, and yet the guy is running neck and neck and seen as a safer pair of hands on things like the economy and immigration, according to the polls? Yes, because Kamala Harris is a problem. She's already in charge. She's running for president, but she's vice president. So she is the co-author of whatever has happened in the U.S. for the past three and a half years. And on the questions of immigration or inflation and the economy uh, in general, uh, Americans are not quite happy with the situation as it is. And uh, the problem with Kamala Harris is... But why is do they think Trump can do better? Because he wasn't so bad when he was president, and that's actually what he was. What is going to tell Americans tomorrow at the debate? That's what he tells in every single one of his meetings. Uh, it, there was no war in uh, in Gaza when he was president. Ukraine had not been invaded by Russia when he was president. Uh, gas was not at seven dollars a gallon in California when he was president. Uh, immigration was not ten million people over three years when he was president. On all those issues that are the one that Americans are concerned about, he has a record to run on because he was president. She has a record to run on too, but she's running away from it. And what she's been trying to do is introduce herself as someone new, because she's not Biden, and she's been quite successful. As long as the Democrats were running the show, which they were doing in, in July and during the convention, she would go up uh, in, in, in the polls, and that was quite logical. And I think she peaked. She peaked at the end of the convention, and now she has to convince voters. We're in the, the, the heart of the campaign, and tomorrow's debate is extremely important for her. And the more she has to focus on the issues, the less she's going to be attractive to voters, because they're going to connect her to the situation as it is, for which she is partly responsible. Elisa Schell? Well, uh, yeah, Trump uh, was president, is not the incumbent now, but is a sort of an incumbent because he, ha he, he was president. Um, and it's, it's an unusual situation where um, a former president loses an election and runs again. So who is the incumbent in, in that election? It's not pretty clear. I agree that uh, Kamala Harris, um, campaigned to appear as the new person in this race, and she is in charge, uh, uh, indeed. So, uh, yeah. But on uh, these issues, the economy, immigration, mm -hmm. how come she's not winning the argument? Well, uh, COVID. Or at least not yet. Well, COVID happened. So the inflation, the inflation is real and hurts. Uh, many uh, middle-class Americans. And as powerful as they are, um, U.S. presidents cannot govern the whole economy and decide uh, when inflation happens or not. So they have some leverage, of course, but they cannot decide everything. So yeah, prices are higher, uh, that's for sure. And immigration, 
there was a crisis a few years ago when COVID restrictions uh, ended, and there was no way to to organize um, a coordinated a coordinated solution. So uh, the Democrats were uh, not keen on restricting access to the United States, and then uh, it was not possible to find um, middle ground or a compromise in Congress. So nothing happened, and that's true that in on immigration and on the economy and inflation, uh, the record is not so good for Democrats, and that's why Kamala Harris and Democrats are running on values, like my values have no change, but they're trying to uh, hide the fact that they have some responsibility. All right, Donald Trump, he, when he was president, uh, uh, allies expressed anxiety over threats to things like quitting NATO. Uh, they also saw a confrontational approach to trade ties with China, most notably. They've now become standard U.S. policy, as has a more protectionist view of global trade. Here is candidate Kamala Harris last week alongside Joe Biden at a rally in front of union members in Pennsylvania, where she rejected the prospective sale of U.S. steel to the Japanese. U.S. steel is an historic American company, and it is vital for our nation to maintain strong American steel companies. And I couldn't agree more with President Biden. U.S. steel should remain American-owned and American-operated. And I will always have the back of America's steel workers. Uh, Dalibor Roach, is this um, standard fare for any presidential candidate in the United States to uh, say that uh, they're going to defend a, a, a large company like this one with strategic interest from uh, falling under foreign ownership? Or is there a whiff of something that's changed? Well, first of all, there is no credible national security argument for preventing the sale of U.S. steel to Japanese company. I mean, if anything, American steel industry has been falling behind in productivity. Japanese steel industry promises to restructure the company and bring it up to the international standard, make it competitive. Uh, so this is really just rank demagoguery, uh, whether it's coming from, from Republicans or, or, in this case, Democrats. And I am worried that there is an emerging consensus on both sides of, of the political aisle for all the polarization that you see in the United States around questions of protectionism, and, and kind of distrust of, of trade and, 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 and economic interlinkages, especially with allies. I can understand the argument for decoupling, for being wary of Chinese investment, of forced technology transfers. Uh, but the best way to deal with the challenge of China and its economic practices, the best way to deal with the challenge posed by Russia and a leaky sanctions regime imposed on Russia is to work with allies, to work with countries like Japan. And, and, and so if this is the new normal, I think, you know, everybody should take note and be more than a little concerned about what lies ahead. Christian Hanley, do you share that concern? Most popular take on this, but this is something that I, I don't believe is actually coming from Donald Trump or from Kamala Harris per se. They are riding a wave of public opinion that's been shifting in this country for years now, uh, especially in, in 2016. We saw Donald Trump at the 11th hour on economic issues only, sort of running to the traditional left of Hillary Clinton going into the general election. Typically, those ideas of being more in favor of trade unions and protectionist economic policies belonged to the left in this country and not to the right, which is much more in favor of free trade. But we've seen, to that point about consensus, we've seen uh, both parties kind of moving a little more in that sort of protectionist direction. I would say, though, that at least on the domestic front, how that would be achieved, it could not be more different between the two current candidates. You have on the one hand, Kamala Harris talking about you know reinvesting in American manufacturing and protecting uh, companies from foreign takeovers, which is in some regards protectionist, but it's still a stark difference from Donald Trump, who's talking about ideas from 100 years ago, like like putting uh, tariffs on on imported products from, from other countries that just simply don't work, and the history bears that out. So there is definitely a similarity in terms of the tone, but there's still a difference on a policy level. Gérard Olivier? What I find interesting here uh, is how both, both candidates are running for the union vote. And uh, if you look at, at history, recent history uh, since FDR, 
uh, the Democrat the Democrat Party has been the party supported by union. It's been the party of the working class, and uh, the UAW uh, went for Kamala Harris. Trump has been courting the the the, the Teamsters Union. And uh, there has been a move by the Republican Party for union voters. And uh, back in August, when uh, RFK Jr. withdrew from the race or suspended his campaign and endorsed uh, Donald Trump, one of his points why he was disappointed with today's Democratic Party is how, in his view, the Democratic Party had turned its back on but we've people, heard that argument for workers, a long time and now. unions. We had uh, with the so-called blue-collar uh, uh, yeah, blue Demo uh, Reagan Democrats, uh, blue-collar yeah. workers in the 1980s who supported the Republicans. And there, at the time, was a very uh, free market view of the world. And but the unions have always been a, a standard support of the Democratic Party. And they're trying to maintain it. They have it for, for the teachers. Uh, they have it for the uh, auto industry. Uh, although the union does not re necessarily represent all of the workers uh, in, in that sector, and a lot of them are extremely disappointed with the democratic policy regarding electric vehicle mandate, for example. So there is obviously today one of the issues in the campaign is the union and the working class vote. We heard at the beginning of this conversation uh, Dalibor Roach tell us how we have to be careful when we use the word populism because uh, it, 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 there is this shift. And what we've seen in both sides of the Atlantic is after COVID, you mentioned COVID earlier, citizens want more protection. Right. Well, um, Harris and Trump are going for... <laughs> for what voters want to hear. So yeah, uh, populism is a very stretchy notion and they, they are, they're trying to appeal to voters with tax cuts, for instance. So Donald Trump promised uh, huge uh, tax cuts on, on, on many uh, levels and Kamala Harris promised the same. So they are going for uh, arguments that can lure the voters to the polls, so to the voting polls. So yeah, um, populism now is diffused in lots of discourses because nobody wants to hear the truth about debt, for instance, uh, about more, uh, more taxes to solve the debt crisis. I mean, this is true in France and in the US. So they have to say what voters want to hear. Right. Uh, um, uh, that brings us back to a point that you made earlier, Christian Hanley, about uh, uh, Americans uh, uh, wanting to have a positive attitude. Uh, Americans are aspirational. They believe uh, in a better future for themselves and their country. But according, uh, Christian Hanley, to a Wall Street Journal poll, less and less, we're looking at a graph uh, there. This was a, a poll recently done. Uh, that the American dream, uh, is, people don't believe in it as much as, as they used to. So th there is this sort of a feel, this fear of decline uh, that's uh, uh, n not yet a majority, but it is growing. Yeah, and it breaks down in, in large extent along generational lines. Uh, people who were earning money before mm -hmm. the so-called Reagan revolution are not going to have that same sort of dim view as those of us who came after who have had a much, much more difficult time being able to get ahead in life, uh, especially economically. <laughs> Uh, since the 1980s, we've seen more and more wealth go to the wealthiest individuals in the country and a tax system that really disfavors working people, people who actually earn their livings every single day. And, and so we do see that both candidates are talking about these issues, but also in very different ways. When you talk about that feel of decline from the Donald Trump camp, we're hearing about decline on a demographic level in terms of in terms of makeup of the country on a racial level level and and just discussing the country in terms of doom and gloom all around on a social and and demographic front. On the Harris campaign side, though, it really is much more about practical solutions to a decline that's purely economic in nature. It's not that the country is flailing. It's that bad economic policy has disfavored working and middle class people. But with that being said, 
said and that being diagnosed, there are then solutions for those problems. So again, there's that idea of decline, that vein of that in American politics and public perception. But I think there are two different answers to that question from, from the two different camps. Dali Borowicz, is, is the decline a perception or is it a reality? Well, there certainly has been a slowdown in economic growth and productivity growth in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world going back to the 1970s. The reality, though, is that uh, the United States remains, in comparative perspective, an unparalleled engine of generating mass prosperity. If you look at uh, the comparison between the European Union uh, as an aggregate and the United States, you'll see that per capita real incomes in the United States are more than 25% higher than, than in Europe. If you were to rank US states and EU countries, you will see that France would be at par with a place like Arkansas, which is the 48th wealthiest uh, state of the Union. Germany would be at par with a place like, like Oklahoma. So, so, so really the gap between the US and Europe is a, is a, is a marked one. If I may, I would like to just challenge um, a claim that Christian made earlier about uh, a sharp distinction to be made between the Trumpian view of trade policy and, and the one pursued by Democrats. I think that distinction is very often less, less, less obvious and, and, and less sharp as, as he depicted it. Uh, first of all, many of President Biden's signature policies were passed with bipartisan support. Uh, through, through Congress, be it the CHIPS Act or, or, or the infrastructure spending. But on trade specifically, I think it is telling that you have the Biden administration maintain steel and aluminium tariffs against the EU for months and months on, that the Biden administration, like the Trump administration, I think is complicit in the demise of the multilateral trading system by refusing to appoint judges to the WTO appellate body. And, and I think there is, when you listen to the, um, the US trade representative, a real sense and, and, of and, 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 agreement on trade, which and, is and that, Dalibor, is that it, just is that just a um, uh, like like Elise was Elisa was saying uh, a, a pandering to uh, to voters, or uh, is it just the reality of how you have to organize globalism? I don't think it's a it's a feature of of this electoral cycle because this really predates this 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 current. The current contest between Kamala Harris and, 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 and former President Trump. It's, you know, you have to look at how Senator Vance worked with Senator Warren in, 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 in the Senate on major pieces of legislation. So, so there is somewhat of a bipartisan consensus, I'm afraid to say, and I think it's one that Europeans in particular should be very wary of because I think the, many of the assumptions that the European Union as a sort of open trading bloc uh, is based on I think, revolve around the role that the United States would continue to play in the world. And we saw no later than this Monday, uh, Gérard Olivier, the uh, former president of the European Central Bank, the former Italian prime minister, coming out with a report stating that the EU has to develop an industrial policy to counter the US and to counter China. Yes, and everybody, they're, they're, they're all trying to, to um, that, that's kind of the, the irony uh, of, of the campaign. So will it be Fortress US, Fortress Europe, Fortress China? It is. Uh, well, it's it's, it's uh, domination China, and I'm not sure that Europe or the US are, are, are still a fortress. But both Kamala, as far as the US is concerned, both Kamala Harris... Uh, and Donald Trump uh, are talking about rebuilding Fortress America. What, what I find striking, uh, it's always been Trump's discourse. He's always been America first. The word was there and, and the name was there. And uh, in what you showed of Kamala Harris speaking at, uh, uh, about that um, Union Steel, uh, she used the word American-owned, American-built, and she was insisting, insisting on that word American uh, because being patriotic is also part of that populist wave, and that's what she was trying to write. Uh, as far as reality is concerned, everybody knows that it's going to be very, very hard on simply economic terms and, and industrial terms to compete with the cost of doing business in Asia as the cost of doing business in the US but or the, the cost the of doing business in Europe. The, the share of the US economy globally has risen the last uh, five years. Its share of the global economy? Um, from what, from 24 to 25? No, from 2020 to 2024. 20, um, it may have COVID. risen a little bit, but if you look at the longer term, uh, back in 1950, the U.S. accounted for over half of global output. Today, it's less than a quarter. 
so the decline in 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 compare in in real terms uh, is is undeniable. That decline doesn't imply that the standards of living are going down, but because they they are going up. But the relative strengths of the U.S. as compared to the rest of the world has never ceased declining ever since the end of World War II. Right. This uh, this feeling about uh, decline we talked about uh, we talked about at the outset. Uh, the uh, German interior minister wanting to uh, put in measures to uh, uh, stop uh, 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 criminals from entering the country, border checks. Uh, when he uh, we talked about the United States and this notion of decline, when he took the mantle from his predecessor last Thursday, the new French prime minister, Michel Barnier, began uh, by listing priorities that included public services, public schooling, security, labor spending and uh, uh, labor spending power and controlling immigration. We will have to respond as much as we can to the challenges, to the anger, you mentioned them, to the suffering, to the feelings of abandonment, of injustice that run through our cities, our neighborhoods and our countryside far too much. Nos quartiers et nos campagnes. The feelings of abandonment. Elisa Schell, your thoughts on that? Well, it's one of the reasons uh, why populism uh, grew, I mean, in Western Europe, uh, because of globalization uh, and the recess of the industrial sector uh, in the economy, uh, the growth of a service economy uh, left a number of workers uh, unemployed and with difficulty to find a new job. So yes, it's one of the reasons. And it happened in such um, a context that uh, leaders from the traditional left or traditional right were not able mm -hmm. uh, to solve the people's problems. So, to, uh, so we are at the heart of the reason of the roots of populism in Western Europe. And now uh, the moderate leaders know that they have to tap into that discourse and policy if they don't want to lose votes mm -hmm. to the extreme right. Christian Hanley, what was your reaction listening to Michel Barnier? You know, it sounded almost as if that had been uh, translated from English to French and then back into English for the purposes of this broadcast, frankly. Uh, it sounded like it could have been, you know, a speech given by an American politician uh, today, right now, especially Donald Trump, but not particularly him, not just him, um, because that's really the sentiment that we have in the United States right now, uh, where you have vast regions of the country uh, that do feel as though they've been left behind um, in this economy and bringing this full circle to the talk about this this sort of economic political consensus across the two different parties. Uh, they have slightly different approaches. I still maintain that, but there is still this attempt right now by both camps to speak to those concerns uh, by people, by voters in places like Pennsylvania, uh, outside of the urban cores that do feel as if they've left, been left behind by a transition over the course of several decades from a more manufacturing center to a more service-based uh, economy. Uh, Dalibor Roach, you agree? I think that's, that's basically right. The, the challenge facing Western European countries and, and, and beyond this is, is, broadly speaking, a shared one. The question is how the populist response can be brought into the fold of democratic politics without a presenting a threat to the constitutional order and b uh, safeguarding uh, safeguarding Western alliances. You see in a place like Hungary uh, that you had a populist leader who basically entrenched himself in power in a way that would be very difficult to undo through through a democratic election. Okay, so let, me uh, there is let me get your reaction on that point. Barnier, named after the president, sounded out the far right's Marine Le Pen. And even though the exchanges were amply reported in the press, the far right leader this weekend denying playing kingmaker. Let's listen. I haven't chosen a prime minister. I'm not Emmanuel Macron's head of human resources. And furthermore, I think only a prime minister from the National Rally can implement the National Rally's project. Dalibor Roach, Marine Le Pen, who's gone to links to say she's, she's not an extremist. She is a mainstream political player. What were your thoughts when you listened to that clip? Well, what is also striking is that she insists that she 
wants no responsibility uh, and she does not want to be a stakeholder in the in the political system, right? Then be blamed for for any possible failures going forward. That's what populists like to do typically. And I think the best way to neutralize them is to, in a way, make them stakeholders, uh, ideally minority stakeholders in the political system. Very few people would be worried about the challenge posed to the Swedish democracy by by, by, by the presence, although implicit, of Sweden Democrats in the governing coalition, or by the fact that Giorgia Meloni is in charge of the Italian government. Neither of those are fundamental threats to democracy. I would venture to argue that the prospect of Donald Trump's returning to the office is very much a threat to the US political system. And I think going forward, the best way to neutralize the appeal of, of Marine Le Pen and National Rally is to is to kind of take 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 the wind off of 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 their sails and make them kind of co-responsible for what is happening in the country. Gerald Olivier, uh, a, a U.S. president who can name Supreme Court justices, uh, is not the same. Uh, Dalibor is saying as, uh, for instance, uh, a Dutch far right leader who even when he finishes first has to govern in a coalition. Yeah, uh, fr France has put itself in, in a very uh, uncomfortable situation. And uh, Emmanuel Macron is largely responsible for what we've been through those past couple of months since a uh, European election. But if we look at, at, at the longer picture, at the, at the bigger picture, it seems to me that what France is going through right now is the result of having blamed the messenger, the messenger far too long uh, instead of having looked at, at the message especially on the issue of immigration, maybe on the issue of social decline and of economic decline. For far too long, going back to François Mitterrand in the 1980s, anyone who denounced the threat of immigration to cultural uh, cohesion or uh, uh, economic power was denounced as a far-right extremist, and the issue of immigration was put under the table under the guise of that extremism, and even though the issue was actually real. And we, we, we reached the moment now when the issue has been ignored for so long, and so many people have felt ignored that you have this wave of populism that gave over 11 million votes to the Rassemblement National uh, 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 a couple of weeks ago. Thanks to the system, this did not turn into a majority at the National Assembly, but the number one party in France today is the Rassemblement National. And it's only logical that they should have a say in the policy that's going to be run, whichever way it's going to be run by Michel Barnier. Uh, Elisa Schell. What Marine Le Pen uh, said in that clip is very much in line with her platform, uh, what we call in French the, the déjabolisation, the normalization of the Rassemblement National. So she has... Uh, she has, ha, has had that line for years now. And what's interesting in the present configuration is that the, the left part of the assembly refused uh, to access power. So they voted against uh, Bernard Cazeneuve. And she, he, she is in position to compromise, to negotiate, to be in a so-called governing party position and not in a protesting party position like the Front National used to be, and like the, the left, the left coalition is So like right Dalibor now. was saying, does this mean she's going to have to get her hands dirty and therefore uh, take some responsibility for whatever happens next? Well, she will have to give a sort of green light or not a red light to Michel Barnier, so that's their role now, uh, so that France is a good position uh, with the European Union when the notation uh, of France uh, will be announced later in September. So uh, France needs to be in a good position uh, towards the European Union regarding the debt crisis we have right now in France. So our role uh, is to let uh, Michel Barnier uh, form his government. Yeah, I agree. And, and if I may, uh, very briefly, Part of populism, uh, of the one we're observing right now, or we've observed for the past couple of decades, uh, is a rise of anti-elitism. And if you look at, at, at France, and especially what happened after the elections of June and July, the legislative election, there was a fight for power among a group of leftists 
who had not really won the election, but together came in as the first party, but not... As a coalition. As a coalition, being the, the one with the largest amount of seats, but far from an, an absolute majority. And they fought over the prime minister, who was going to be prime minister. They were sharing the cake be before he was even there. Mm. And I thought that was almost uh, undignified. Mm. And I think many voters looked at it with great disdain, if not disgust and surprise, and a typical behavior from the elite, who are not after what the people are living through, their, their sufferings, their, their, their requests, their hope, their aspirations, but rather let's get to power and just, you know, be who we are. Uh, Christian Hanley, uh, the, it was 2016 when uh, Hillary Clinton at a fundraiser uh, talked about the basket of deplorables mm -hmm. of uh, uh, people from a hard scrabble background who supported her opponent. Uh, is that still haunting the Democrats? I don't think it's still haunting the Democrats directly. Uh, you know, the quote, as it was originally said, was, of course, immediately taken out of context. It was not that everybody who came from a hard scrabble background was was deplorable. It was the people who were the most venomous, who supported Donald Trump the most fervently in his anti-immigrant, anti basically everybody agenda that he had in 2016 and still has to this day. But you saw ever since then, for the past eight or so years, an entire uh, right-wing media ecosystem spring up on the internet in the United States. They're really cashed in on that, you know, casting this, this, this dividing line between uh, people who then sort of took on that moniker as the deplorables versus everybody else who was Democrats or elites or, or whomsoever the perceived enemy was. But what we're seeing ever since really Biden came into office, but then now with, with the continued campaign of Kamala Harris is uh, a much more renewed focus on working in middle class issues, courting the union vote, and and by many measures, with Biden being uh, the most pro-union president since FDR, uh, that bodes well for Kamala Harris on that front. And you know, there's Hillary Clinton did speak of the DNC this past go around, but there's a palpable difference in the feeling around Kamala Harris in this current campaign versus Hillary Clinton in 2016. And we shall see what happens on Tuesday in Pittsburgh with. Uh, that showdown uh, with, uh, between Donald Trump and uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, Christian Hanley, many thanks for being with us from Washington. Dalibor Rohatch, also in the U.S. Capitol. Gérald Olivier, Elisa Schell, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.